This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. To Gramercy Square, where young Edith and her family would be staying, was the home of the Pinchot family. Businessman James Wallace Pinchot, his wife, Mary Jane Eno Pinchot, and their children, Gifford, Amos, and Antoinette. The Pinchot family had recently completed the building of a new Milford, Pennsylvania home that had been designed by the noted New York City architect Richard Morris Hunt and subsequently dubbed Gray Towers. The Pinchot's oldest son, Gifford, was away studying at Yale, and Edith and her sisters knew Nettie Pinchot from dancing class in Newport. The four-story brick house was Italianate in style, with cast-iron railings gracing its small balconies and floor-to-ceiling parlor windows. Edith's brother, Daniel, who went by his middle name, Leroy, was in his final year at Columbia, which meant that he would again be living under the same roof as his sisters. Susan, the oldest, was now 24 and two years older than Leroy. Natalie was 19 and Pauline, the baby, was still just 12. The family would be together, nestled in this house across from the gated park. From outside those parlor windows looking in, one might have seen four young ladies and one young man living the kind of gleaming 19th century life envied by scores of less fortunate citizens of the time. A closer inspection of their lives, however, revealed signs of difficulty and strain, like scuff marks hidden beneath the smooth veneer of a freshly polished parlor floor. They were five siblings, separated in age by 12 years, joined, as so many other families of the time were, by tragic loss. Edith's parents had met at West Point, New York, where her father was a cadet and her mother, Susan Fish Leroy, was staying nearby with her family at the Rose Hotel. After George Warren Dresser graduated from the United States Military Academy and posted at Fort Adams outside Susan's home of Newport, he pursued his love. It was not an easy road. The Fish Leroy family was exceptionally well known in New York circles where names carried the weight of history and bore the shackles of expected romantic pairings. First, middle, last, and family names were shuffled around from generation to generation, perpetually recombining DNA of societal rank so that they would always be a part of one's title, ensuring that even the smallest link to storied heritage was immediately evident upon one's first introduction. Fish, Leroy, King, Skirmerhorn, Stuyvesant. Edith's mother had bestowed upon Edith a middle name taken from the surname of their ancestor, the famed Dutch governor, Peter Stuyvesant. It would serve Edith in future times when money could not. Edith's father was a congenial, accomplished, and educated man with an honorable, if humbler, background than that of her mother. George Warren Dresser was of New England stock, educated at Andover, and hailing from a line of teachers, farmers, and lawyers. Edith's grandfather, Daniel Leroy, did not consider him an appropriate match for Edith's mother and objected vocally and often to George and Susan's union. But her mother's older sister, Auntie Mary Kang, who herself had made a predictably wealthy yet loveless match, stood firmly on the dresser side of love. Auntie King welcomed George into her home in Newport, where he was free to call on her sister. Hearts won out. In April 1863, at Calvary Church in New York, a line of groomsmen in uniform stood proudly by as George Warren Dresser married Susan Fish Leroy. Then George headed south to war along with classmates, volunteers, and countless immigrants just arrived from places like Ireland and Germany. George rose from a second lieutenancy in the 4th Artillery to major before the war ended. Along the way, he fought in the Battle of Bull Run and commanded a company out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, where he played a vital part in securing federal supply lines against Confederate attack. Once the war ended, George's accolades mattered little to Edith's grandfather, who insisted his son-in-law resign from the military and give his daughter the opportunity to live a life more worthy of her bloodline. George consented and began a career in civil engineering. He made friends easily and acted as editor of the trade publication American Gaslight Journal. He had bright, dark eyes, a barrel physique, and wore his hair parted down the middle with just the suggestion of a wave on each side. The lower half of his face was wreathed in the friendly mutton chops popularized by Civil War General Ambrose Burnside. George welcomed all into his home, the children of friends, army comrades, gas workers. Edith's mother was more soft-spoken, attentive to her children, skilled with a needle and thread, and purposely eschewed much of the life laid out for her. 
she loved her George dearly. Of any residences in New York or Newport, the one perhaps most deeply etched into the minds of the dressmakers.